Welcome to the XY Advisor Podcast, a global community of financial advisors sharing and learning with one another to drive the positive evolution of financial advice. To get involved, go to xyadvisor.com or simply download the XY Advisor app. Portfolio construction and risk management are tasks that take you away from where you need to be, building relationships with your clients. Aberdeen Standard Investments can support you by creating bespoke investment solutions. Outsourcing portfolio and risk management creates efficiencies, enabling you to focus on fulfilling the ambitions of both your clients and your business. This podcast has been prepared with care based on sources believed to be reliable and all opinions expressed are honestly held at the applicable date. However, it is general information only and we accept no liability for any errors or omissions. Just be prepared without taking into account the particular objectives, financial situation or needs of any investor. Investing involves risk, including the risk of losing capital. It's important that before acting, investors should consider their own circumstances, objectives, and financial situation. The information's appropriateness to them and consult financial and tax advisors. Investors should consider the PDS available at AberdeenStandard.com before making an investment decision. Products issued by Aberdeen Standard Investments Australia Limited, ABM 59002123364, AFSL number 204263. Thanks for joining us on another episode of the XY Advisor Podcast. I'm your host, Fraser Jack, and we are talking all things scale. And so who better to talk uh, scale and to introduce the idea of technology than uh, Paul Feeney? Welcome. Thanks, mate. Glad to be here. Now, you run a startup. That's probably not a startup anymore. It's actually a full-fledged, you know, ongoing organization, but around the idea of scale in financial advice. Yeah. Um, so it's basically a digital platform that lets anyone build a personal financial plan by themselves and figure out their question of what do I do next? Fantastic. So uh, we'll we'll get into the details there, but let's go back in time a little bit. How did you start this process? I know you came from a um, you know a, an advice background. Yeah, it's about oh, 15, 16 years ago. I started as a financial planner in Sydney as an accounting firm, looking after mums and dads. Uh, moved across to Perpetual, looking after sort of the mass affluent, if you can say that, uh, and then moved on to Credit Suisse at the private bank, looking after people on the old rich list. So the whole gamut of type of clients from mums and dads right through to the uber wealthy uh, in the country. So I saw it all, but they all have a similar need. Regardless of the commas, it's really around, you know what I want to do next? So what are the next steps for me to get there so I can achieve the things that are important to me? Um, you know, and they're fundamentally the same for people in the end. Yeah, and you obviously have this idea in your head that it's very difficult to affect change at, at scale when you're only sitting in front of one person at a time. Yeah, I mean, that's an advice business. You're limited by the number of hours in the day um, and how many hours you can work with people. And you multiply that by number of advisors, and that's how many clients a, a firm can actually practice. So, for me, it's it's you've got to look at it differently if you want to solve that access to advice issues. And tech, for me, is is the obvious solution. Yeah, and so obviously, uh, a big fan of tech, another tech nerd, uh, much like myself, we love the stuff. Um, tell us what the decision was then to to sort of stop being you know a, a private you know ultra high net worth client uh, advisor, which is you know some people's dream. Uh, to almost doing a 180 and saying, well, how do I how do I help all the people that can't afford to pay for my uh, absorbent fees for the amazing advice I provide? Yeah, it was a dream. You know, go and work for a Swiss bank and all that sort of stuff, the, the ultimate in, in private banking and all those sort of things. And it's not what it is, what you think in your head. It's nothing like it at all. Uh, but it was fun. Uh, I had a great time doing it. I left there and went and started another business with a colleague and which took us to London and we sold that out. And, and during that time, I was thinking, oh, gee, what am I going to do now? So, well, I like giving advice, but I don't want to go back and do it the way I was doing it before. And it just dawned on me. So, well, surely in a country like Australia, every single person should be able to have the information they need when they need it to make a well-informed financial decision. And so wealth management, what we do, I think we'll agree it's not rocket science, but it is a highly complex thing that we've got to do because we've got to take into account a lot of variables and there's a lot of legislative environments around us that give us a framework that we've got to work with him. But once you understand what a person, where the person is right now and what they want to do, their data tells you what they should do next. Yeah. So because it's a fairly logical process that we go through as advisors, really triaging um, where money should go and everything else. So I thought, well, surely we can program this. Surely we can do it. And but do it in a way where clients drive the process so that you don't need human beings behind there pulling levers and pressing buttons and so forth to give the advice. And and that was the start of it, the first thoughts of it, gee, about six six years ago. Um, I wrote a little 
little white paper about it and just dump my thoughts, a big brain dump, uh, down a piece of paper and shared it with some mates for some feedback. And you did that. You shared it with some mates and they said, yeah, you could have built it. Um, yeah. Was, was, I, that, was that good advice from them or was that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I keep on looking back now and all the, the, the depth of work and the challenge we've had. It's like, gee, I think I'm onto something here, but I'm either the village idiot or, or we are onto something because it is highly complex. And as soon as you, and we all know, as soon as you solve a problem for a client, then you think, well, what about a client like this? Oh, gee, okay, we've got to solve that solution as well. We've got to build that into the decision tree and all that sort of stuff. But quite a few people said, yeah, have a crack at it. And so I thought, well, look, just to de-risk a bit more, I did a little video. I don't know if you can still find it on uh, YouTube or wherever it was, on Vimo, just saying this is what we're trying to build. And I thought, ah, you know, if I get 500 likes, I'm going to build it. You end up getting 3,500 likes inside two weeks. And I thought, okay, gee, I better go and build it. And so, you know, people say stop talking about it, just do it. Yeah. And so the avalanche came up and had to do it. Good little validation to let you know that you're on the right track. Uh, yeah. But, of course, uh, that track's not an exactly an easy track. How did you go about starting up a, uh, a technology business? Yeah, so like I said, I did a bit of a brain dump to begin with, and I went out to find people who could actually help me build just the first little aspect of it. I had friends who have an agency, um, and I got them to build out the first MVP. We stayed with them for about a year or so, uh, and then we started basically getting developers in-house. But in between there, the journey of, okay, how am I going to fund it? I had a bit of cash myself from the last business. But then going out and getting individual investors, uh, which then brings another layer of complexity to what you've got to do when you're running a business and everything else. So that was an interesting journey alone. Just the first investors came on. Literally, it's the cliche thing. We're in a actually at a pub talking about what I'm doing and drawing on the back of the coast saying this is what I want to try and do and this is how it could work. Yeah, sure, Paul, we know, Lee, let's, let's give you a few bucks, let's have a go. And that's how it really started. Yeah, that's always the way, isn't it, with that first early round? That they're actually just looking at your passion for it and, you know, what you're trying to achieve. And, uh... Yeah, and then in any business, if you get external investors, they're backing you. And because the story makes sense, but they're backing you, that you can fulfil that story. Um, so looking at two things there, but ultimately it comes down to the backing yourself and then the team that you get around you. And then they continue to back you if you continue to keep them up to date, engage them and, and take them along the journey with you as well. Yeah. And as you start building out, one of the hardest things to get is, you know, new clients, new people on. Um, how did you go about that? Well, we were basically in hibernation for about two years um, to build. A, so we did a little MVP, showed it, got some more validation, said, great. Now let's go down and and break down the process of how people manage their money and build out the tech in the back end. Um, and so built that out, came out with a really awful looking UX. It was disgraceful. When I started, I didn't even know what a UX was. Um, so I've come a long way. Yeah. Um, but sort of built that out um, and then started to get the feedback. And we got our first client, Ernst & Young, um, to provide this to all their staff. So that's about three and a half years ago that they come on board, which is great validation for us uh, yeah. as a business. Now, this, that now you, you brushed over the fact that this is two years yeah. <laughs> in the making. Two years is not just a drop in the hat. That's a long period of time where you've got to keep backing yourself and uh, and telling yourself that you are on the right track and to keep going. I'm sure there was moments when you were ready to bang your head against the wall. Oh, mate, there were moments where I've got the old, you know, looking up for, for jobs and all that sort of stuff, thinking I've just got to go back and get a job here. This is ridiculous. What am I, I'm just kidding myself that I can do this. No one else is doing it, so... They must know something more than me. But then the little thing just in the back of your, back of your head just keeps saying, no, you've got to have a go at this. You've got to have a go because if you can do it, it's going to be a great thing for a lot of people. And if you do well by clients, everything else takes care of itself from my perspective. But there are lots of peaks and troughs continually, but then you bring some backers on behind you and they encourage you and they then bring other backers on there as well so it starts to gather momentum itself. Then all of a sudden you've hired two, three people to help you build it out I'm now responsible for their salaries and so forth. So you want to make sure it keeps going. And that pushes your momentum a little bit more. And then all of a sudden you try and do something and then, you know, you talk to the lawyers and go, oh, you can't do that. The regulation means this and this and this. Ah, okay, let's go back. Let's try that again. And so you've got all these different competing pressures to try and get something up you want to make nice and easy. And then you're doubting yourself that you should do it at all. But I don't think anyone who started a business whatever shape or size, doesn't doubt themselves at some stage. Yeah. Now, your first client you mentioned was Ernest & Young. Um, yeah. inter really interesting from, from your point of view, well, from, from the outside watching in at the time, I remember when you when you that first happened, that was a, such a big deal. And, of course, you know, bringing on such a massive client as your first client, but also 
um, you know, you sort of built this thing so that people can get direction of where they're going and sort of people then assumed maybe it was for that, um, the end of the market where people couldn't afford financial advice. Um, but then to pick up a client where, you know, most of the employees are well paid and, and yeah. theoretically know their way around a financial plan. Well, t- talk yeah. us through that moment. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's, it's funny how we make these assumptions, yeah, on, well, you know, the plumber with the leaky tap side of the type of thing. I think there's a lot of advisors and I'm an ex-advisor, or still am, I suppose, who, you know, just ignores some stuff. And I, you don't want to focus on it, you just want to do other things. Um, and so it's those assumptions that we found really interesting. But I basically went through all of my network and, and when we had the MVP, just going out and talking to people and telling them what I'm doing. Getting, and it was quite easy to get the meetings because all I'm doing is asking people who I know for advice. Everyone loves to get a phone call. Hey, can I buy you a coffee for some advice? Everyone loves that stroke of the ego and so forth. That Yeah, yeah I'm good enough. I'll give you some advice. But it helped a great deal. It disarms people. They open up their doors and you have a chat. And I got to a couple of partners at Ernst & Young. And they said, you know what? We just did a survey a couple of months ago. And the biggest issue was financial stress. So you've got to talk to so-and-so because this could be a solution for that. And so it's the serendipity of actually having those conversations. But when you're starting business or entrepreneurial, you're running a business, if you're not out talking to new people and particularly people outside your circle, you're going to miss opportunities, which can take you in a direction that you never would have thought possible. And I always thought advisors, they're going to love this. We're going to go there first and then we'll go direct to consumers. But then all of a sudden that sliding door moment opens and this whole thing about employee financial well-being, we started doing that about three and a half years ago with them, um, opens up to us. And that's been our focus now um, as well. So it's, it's quite interesting how these things can happen. Yeah, now this, this is the validation moment, right? You, you've got a big client on. Uh, they are enrolling a, a stack of their staff yeah. in, into uh, the my plan. Um, talk us through that. What was the take-up like? Was it did, Were you surprised in any way of what how that rolled out? Yeah, so we're learning as we go, yeah? So it's interesting. Firms like that, we took, they, they're all well-paid and they've got their financially astute and so forth. The average age of a firm like that with 5,000 staff is 28. Yeah? So it's really heavy bottom on, on the lower age, which is a lower income, but still higher than the average person. But they were very much more tech, like interested in using tech. So we thought, you know, we'll just set up this website. Anyway, I'll send a couple of emails out and it'll work. Great. You get a little lift and it just falls off a cliff. So then we started to develop some internal webinars just to teach people about different aspects of financial well-being, what it means, but then... How do you manage your debts? How do you manage your savings, your investments for retirement, and, you know, and what is insurance, how does it work, and all those sort of things. And then we started to develop essentially a six-month promotional campaign internally that the HR rewards staff can use to implement within the organisation. Because when you're selling B2B, the person you're talking to is thinking not outside of price. It's like, how is this going to make my job more difficult? You know, if it's going to make my job more difficult, I don't want to borrow it. So you've got to try and take all of those friction points away. And we learned that over the year or so with those guys. And now a new client, we get them up and running in a couple of weeks. We sit down and say, oh, what's your internal promotional campaigns look like uh, for staff and communication campaigns? Right. Some of them have a well-being month or whatever. So we slot stuff in. And then in between, so like here are 12 different emails that we know work. And they work on these days at this time that we've seen. So we just give them a blueprint. So here you go, edit those documents and, and push that out. To truly make that seem, but we're still experimenting and still making it up as we go along, um, as we all do, you know what I mean? But it's it's trying to make it easy for them to get it out there. But we got around about 15% penetration up to about 20%. And then we launched a new platform uh, last year. And now we get, I think, 19 is the lowest and 36, and 36, 37% across the entire workforce for some organisations is the penetration we get now. So that's that UX stuff and the better comms. Uh, internally with them all. I think as well, the management like it, one, because we've got our own AFSL. So we're, we've got our own retail financial services license. We're regu- regulated like any other financial planner. We choose not to push products. We're just trying, we'll come back to that later on, but just really focusing on what do they do next, regardless of the product, they can keep using them on they've got. But also what we do for the employer and the management there is we provide macro de-identified data that basically highlights what are the financial pain points that exist in your organisation. And we can break that down by gender, by age group, by office, all that sort of stuff. And we've now had some of these organisations come back to us and tell us that they've changed the employee benefits to better reflect what actually is happening inside their organisation. 
So that's quite powerful, and I'm quite proud that 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 sort of stuff happens as a result of of people using the platform. Yeah, proud proud's a really good way to describe it. I would imagine. Yeah, yeah, it's nice. Yeah, it, there's, I mean, everyone who's listening to us, most of us are advisors who listen to these sort of podcasts and stuff. And all of us, if we're not here because we actually want to help people, deep down, all of us, if you really think it, you, you've got a desire to help people, otherwise you're in the wrong game. Yeah, because there's a social good to what we're doing. If we help improve people's lives, they can do better things. They've got more money to do stuff and they can help their community. The community's better. The economy's better. Everything, everyone else is better off because they receive good advice. So yeah. let's just try and make sure more people get access to it. Yeah. Now, now uh, let's go back to the Ernest & Young. You've, you've had it validated. You've made some changes. What, what were the next few clients for you and how, how did they come on? Yeah, so we we then had a – who was the next one? I think it might have been Suncorp and then Sun Super and Medibank it was soon after that. Um, but they sort of came – start of – at the end of 2019, early 2020, when we're developing the new platform, um, and then a few more from there. And, and it's been great because the biggest validation they want is to speak to someone who's used it. So, yeah, great, you can speak to XYZ partner at Ernst & Young and they can have a chat to you and, you know, I'm selling it. So yes, my words yeah, are word, exactly. but they want to speak yeah. to someone who's used it and so that's helped. And, and they've been a great support for us as Ernst & Young partners there, which has been fantastic. But then the learnings and the different experiments that those different organisations have had uh, make a difference as well. And then Rio Tinto's come on board as well. We work with employee assistance program providers who use it for their staff. Um, and we've got about six more in the pipeline at the moment as well. So there's about, I think for them, there's about 15 or so companies that, that use it at the moment. And there's about, about 10,000 or so, I think, people using the platform. 10,000 people using the platform. Now, there's some scale for you in a, sh- in a few short years. Um, yeah. Now, when, I mean, I've, I've been talking to you about this for, for a number of years, but, you know, one of the thoughts at the time was financial advisors. This would be great for financial advisors to implement their business for a number of reasons. Obviously, we're talking, you know, that they can't afford to service a particular level of client or the, the children of their existing, you yeah. know, good clients, all those sorts of things. I, I remember you really sort of went heavy into that at one point to see if that was going to be a great thing, but it didn't really work out the way you thought it was going to. No, I, I think there's, there's two things. I mean, we get a binary outcome from advisors. One of it's like, oh, you can't replace me. You can't do that sort of stuff. It's not going to work. It's like, on one, I'm not trying to replace you. But the others who see it say, wow, okay, now I can scale. Instead of looking after 100, 150 clients, I could look after 2,000. And the data tells me when I should have a chat to them, but also coaches them along the way so that they get beyond just paying off credit card debt and building an emergency fund. But then also when we started talking to advice practices, the hardest thing was when someone is an authorised rep underneath a licensee, you've then got a whole nother layer of stuff to go through and they're already dealing with so much complexity and everything else. So the sweet spot that we're finding now is advisors who have got their own licence. That makes, because they make the decisions and they make the decisions where they go. And, and you can use the platform under your own licence. So the SOA producers is theirs and everything else. But that's made a bit of a difference. And yeah, it, it may have been the way we communicated, the way we went out and all that sort of stuff. And, you know, you live and learn all the whole way through. I think we'll still be working with advisors at some stage with finding the, the niche but also the economics around it all that make it work uh, for us and for them because there's no sense it's got to be a win-win from both on that side. If They've got to be making more money than what our fees are. Otherwise, they're going to stop using the platform. Like any piece of software that a practice uses, it's got to be, you know, it's got to improve the bottom line. Yeah, Otherwise, return on investment, more. yep. Uh, or, or in saying that, though, a lot of the time that the – the return on investment may not be that year, but, you know, you people that are using the, the system are sort of working their way up to getting financial advice, if you like. They're sort of, you know, getting a few things in place and then, you know, uh, patching up a few gaping wounds, like maybe their cash flow, and then they get yeah. into themselves a position where they want to go forth and then speak to an advisor. That might not happen this year, but that might be next year. Yeah, so if you've got a, if you've got a solution as an advice practice that you've got a long tail of lower revenue clients. Yeah, and I think that's the most polite way we can put it. They're not ready to, you can't put your hand on your heart and say, pay me the three to $5,000 or whatever it may be to be a, a client and a fee for service. But you know at some stage when that tsunami of wealth transfer comes down, they're going to be an ideal client. But if you haven't, if you're not at the table educating them now, it's going to be pretty hard to get their attention at that point. So the platform would allow them to stay in touch, continue to just just the cash flow coaching and that sort of stuff and, and understanding how the super works and what today's action means for, for the future and, and what insurance should I have and how does insurance work? Do I even have any insurance? All that sort of stuff. If you help people along that sort of path, then at the very least you're going to be at the table when that wealth transfer happens or the salary increases or you know they're now married and they put two 
two, um, two incomes together and they can do things there, all that sort of stuff. And, and wealth management is a long, long game, yeah? It's, yeah. There's no quick wins. If, if, if an advisor comes in the room and says, hey, here's a quick win for you, the client should get up and run away. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly right. Um, and, and to me, it's about not, not so much about the price but the value, right? So the value yeah. of, you know, that client getting two or three years worth of value from you um, with very little in return, all of a sudden that creates a long, you know, a trusted relationship. Yeah, exactly. And the economics for us are quite low. It doesn't, it doesn't cost a great deal each month for, for someone to be using it. But it's, it's all about starting to get those habits right. You know what I mean? It's, it's should I put more money into super if I've still got credit card debt? Well, if you're in your 20s or 30s, probably not. You probably should be paying your credit card off first and going and doing the other stuff. So it's just helping them with that, like we said earlier, information they need when they need it to make those well-informed decisions. Um, and you can do that that way, but an advisor can't do that with their time because the biggest thing for me, and I'm going to do a little segue here, but we, about the access to advice with um, ASIC's paper out there, I see a lot of commentary around there and people saying, look, regulation is so expensive, the insurance is so expensive, all these different protocols we've got to follow, it makes advice so expensive. But if we take a step back and we look at the balance sheet or the profit and loss of any advice practice, the biggest single variable cost, the highest one, is salary because you've got to pay for someone's time. The more time an individual, an advisor has to spend in giving the advice, the more the advice is going to cost. So let's try and decrease that for the clients that don't necessarily need the complex full-on face-to-face stuff that the traditional advice that I've been in the past. Yeah, yeah, I definitely agree that um, computing um, best outcomes you know, is only going to get um, more and more uh, done by you know com- computers, if you like. Um, because you know they can it can easily do that. Now you're absolutely right about the the you know, staff being the biggest cost and and sort of trying to remove that comp, um, part of the equation. When it comes to decision making though inside a client's head, sometimes the 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 numbers just don't just aren't enough. Like as yep. in they um, you know oh financially it makes sense, but um, you know emotionally I'm caught up over here and I end up making the wrong decisions. And I guess that's where the human do, you know. Uh, accountability for like comes involved. Um, yeah. Are you finding that with your system? People sort of, um, you know, do the calculations but may not follow the plan? Yeah. And, and I used to find that when I was an advisor at all types yeah. of levels of clients. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we definitely do find that. Um, and that's okay because all we're doing is, is we're never judging anyone. We're just basically saying, look, given what you've told me about you and the goals that you've told me you've got. And yeah, we don't have the nuances and so forth and everything else, but that takes human interaction, which is human time and salary, therefore higher cost. Um, so a lot of people can't afford to pay for that. But what it does then is for us, when one piece of data changes, so we've given a suggestion, the data says this, but then they go, oh, and I've gone and done this and they spent the money elsewhere. Well, they update their plan with that and all the advice and recommendations and tips are recalibrated to take that into account. That's great that you've done that. That was obviously more important to you. Don't worry, we can still do this, but with this amount of money. It'll take a little bit longer, but that's okay. Yeah, I, on track. when I think of that, I, I visualize the concept of, you know, giving somebody or showing somebody a map to get from A to B and then saying, now go, uh, and not giving them the map or them having the map in, in the in the drawer. But then, uh, uh, you know, what, you know, you called map my plan, but it's almost like it's a GPS, right, that up- updates itself along yeah. the way. So you're driving along, you take a wrong term, it doesn't really matter. You yeah. just calculate from the new spot to where you need to yeah. get to. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's like a Google Maps with financial life and to the point where, where someone links their bank account fees into Map My Plan, and, and the great thing about the platform is you get utility whether you do that or not, because not everyone's comfortable doing that. And if they do, great. And not even not all like, institutions can be linked. But if they link that, we basically update the balances and the transactions at 2 a.m. every day. So, like you said, it's Google Maps. You're driving along, and then five minutes later, you look. Oh, geez, I'm in the wrong place. Recalibrates and away you go. You come back a month, two months, six months, whatever it may over a day. But whatever day you log back onto your plan, it reflects today's situation. Even if there's been a change in regulations and so forth, it's taken that into account as well. So all of a sudden it says, well, this is what you should be doing now, but just make sure everything else is up to date before you go and do it. And they can go through and say, oh, actually, it's now more important for me to save for kids' education. I didn't tell you I've got a kid, right? Here we go. Oh, great. Let's change all that. Boom, you should be doing this now. And you take it from there. I mean, it needs to be a dynamic service when we're looking at a, a solution like that. It can't be a static point in time, like when I was an advisor 15 years ago, you give the SOA two weeks later, like after two weeks after the first meeting, and you see them again in six or 12 months, things have changed in that time. You want it to be a living dynamic sort of plan. 
Yeah, exactly. uh, which is what we do. Exactly, and uh, that all relies on accurate data. And now, not just that, but over the years we've just talked about stats that you've said, you know, people that are using this or doing that are this sort of better off. And, and I know those stats are just getting better and better as, the, as you said, the user experience is becoming more and more enjoyable for people and you're building out. So t- talk to us about some of those stats around how people are better off on um, on the system using it, um, that, that you know, versus where they could have been or might have been when they first joined. Yeah, so we've got a lot of qualitative and quantitative um, data, uh, which is always interesting to look at. Just got to bring some stuff up in there as well. But it's it's also like 47% of people tell us that I now feel comfortable about where I'm going after using Map My Plan for six months. Uh, for me, which is which is a fantastic sort of thing. Um, and 34% of people feel less worried uh, about the financial situation. But when someone's following our advice on a much more sort of quantitative measure, their superannuation ends up lasting over four years longer because they're making the extra contributions. People are paying their credit card down four and a half times quicker, saving about one and a half thousand dollars in interest by following the advice on the platform. Um, and so all of a sudden when you do that, you're accelerating their ability to be able to do the next thing that they can go forward. And, and for us, we always like get rid of non-deductible debt, get your, get your rainy day fund, your emergency fund sorted. After it's like, wow, what's important to you now? Um, and then we just, and if they don't tell us, we just take over and say, well, hey, we'd suggest looking at this. But now you give us a new piece of information, it changes again. So to be able to measure that sort of stuff is great. And we can't measure for everyone uh, because you know, the ones who have linked their bank accounts, we can really see how much quicker they're paying stuff off and saving stuff. But even the ones who haven't linked their accounts, we can do through surveys that we look at and their attitudes to their situation at the moment, how they're feeling, all that sort of stuff. Um, we can see that they're feeling less stressed after using that my plan. And, and that's the sort of data that we share with employers uh, without going into the micro of, of who it is, obviously. Of course, that's a pretty good story to bring to uh, a, the, your next you know, client. Um, yeah, yeah I, I really love the idea of collecting you know, qualitative data, not just quantitative. You know, you are just financially in a, in a inverted commas, better position as we, as we like to use that term, yeah. but you might emotionally be, you know, emotionally in a better position. And, you know, just to have those stats, you know, you have those stats to show that people um, feel more secure in the, by this percentage, you know, that they feel this or they, f- you know, feel, um, you know, like they've got their stuff, to, you know, their, their bits and pieces together and the feeling of confidence capturing that, I think is so important. How would you suggest, you know, the average financial advisor running a practice that like you used to do um, start collecting that data? Yeah, well, the first and foremost, it's in the conversations with your clients, uh, for sure. And I mean, that's anecdotal, but it's still it's still worthwhile. Do you know what I mean? And that's where you can get those testimonials from and so forth as well. But it's also going back out to the clients and saying, I want you to judge me and my firm. Be open to that judgment because it's only going to improve you in the past. And you'll be amazed the nuggets that come back. And, and our first survey with clients was, judge us. Tell us what you like, what you don't like, but tell, then tell us how you're feeling here and all that sort of stuff. And it's great. you get great feedback. Uh, you've got to have some thick skin, though. That's for sure. <laughs> you definitely do. <laughs> uh, uh, some of the comments. I don't like this color. Can you change that? It's like, yeah, we could. <laughs> but I think there are more valuable things we could spend our time on <laughs> and money on. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Oh, fantastic! Yeah, I think I think it's you know you you take that information to an employer and it's um all of a sudden it becomes a, a, a bit of a no brainer, doesn't it? Yeah, oh, it definitely does. And and they like that sort of stats and they'd like to to see that. And then they're like we get someone's like three weeks later they start like right, give us the stats. Like, well, just, we've got to get a few more people using it. We're getting there, uh, but they're really eager to see the proof points uh, within their organisation. And the thing, other they really want to, they're really eager to have the proof point against the rest of the cohort of people using Map My Plan. But then also we've done Australia-wide surveys of about 1,600, 1,700 people and we can compare them against the average um, Australians as well. We did one during COVID and it was really interesting what came out there that the two the two most critical things that people worried about, and this was in May, right in the middle of everyone being locked down, was job security and not having enough actual rainy day emergency funds. And now we look at the savings rates. Well, that one's taken care of and the job rate's coming back up, which is fantastic. And then the last one was being worried about having to go and use credit cards because they didn't have enough savings. And those yeah, are the yeah. three things. And, and those ones there, they're wealth-destroying things, yeah, if you can't sort those things out. Yeah. So now with the, now with the, the size of the business and the sample size of the amount of um, end users, um, humans using the system, uh, you're able to actually produce some, some fairly good stats around you know, with a well-structured data model, really good stats around and then create papers on the way people are feeling in, in large numbers. Yep. 
Yeah, so we continue that. We've spoken at a few little seminars and so forth that we, we go about and doing that. It's, it's just looking at that data, which lets you come back, and it's, it's almost like a pulse survey. Um, how are people feeling now? And, and we do it with a mix of outside Mapmo Plan users and internally as well. And, and we've got to get better with that. Uh, I don't think we're doing it well enough uh, at the moment. Um, and it's something we'll continue to work on. But it's, it's such a great resource to be able to, to pull that back and, and see what they are. And the Mapmo Plan users don't reflect Australia-wide. They reflect the cohort or the demographics, I suppose, of the types of organisations that are currently using Mapmo Plan. So and, and most of them are basically mid-20s to, to mid-40s is the big sort of 75 80% of people seem to sit in that sort of space uh, at the moment, which sort of reflects that old, the older you get, the more likely you are to go and get advice uh, and so forth as well, uh, which reflects that too. But it's also a reflection of the demographics of those companies uh, that are using it. Yeah, now I, now I just want to go back to the idea that um, how you can work with uh, advisors, you know, listening to this podcast, for example. To me, it's almost like a, part of a social media, uh, part of a marketing program, part of a how do we help, uh, and I don't like to use the word sort of top of the funnel, but that whole scenario around, you know, helping people that may one day become a client and, and, and pro- providing an offering. Now, I know you guys do that in a way where you can actually start, you know, looking at ways of white labeling, white labeling yeah. with planners. Do you want to talk to us about how you, how you do that? Yeah, so if an advisor comes through, so we're talking to two firms at the moment, I've got their NAFSL. Um, they can completely white label the platform. Um, they can change some of the variables inside the algorithms to make sure, for example, if you walk through the virtual door, through that my plan, or through the physical door, um, you want to make sure the person gets the same quantum of life insurance and the advice. So you can change the calculation, the variables that go in the calculation that we have there. Um, another thing, the growth rates and all those sort of things, just to make sure you've got some consistency. But typically how advisors then are talking about using it is, is it's one of a couple of different ways. Um, First, it's really looking at the long tail of, of those lower revenue clients. So they want to continue to serve, but it's not economical with a, a face-to-face sort of relationship. It's transferring them across to the platform, letting them activate it, fill in the gaps that they may not have because it might just be an insurance client or, or something like that or a bit dated. They then fill that out, but the advisor gets to see the data in the back end as well. So they can actually proactively contact those clients because the very beginning when they sign up, they say, look, going to use this platform we want to be proactive in our advice so we're going to approach you when we know we can add value but we'll then also put buttons like i need help contact my advisor buttons all the way through it so as they're building their plan they're figuring out how much life insurance they need it's like oh that's interesting boom i need help and advisor's never going to get a little more lead in their life than someone in the middle of building their plan themselves and they go on so i remember when i was an advisor quite a few years ago the, the first meeting was awful um, you know, it's like pulling, it's compliance and data collection driven. You're getting all this information, stuff's going around your head, but you can't really talk too much about the strategies and what you're going to do, which is where the real value is. They've got to, they leave that meeting with some faith in you that you're going to come back with something valuable. Well, imagine if the client's gone through and filled out that fact find, but in a way that not is like, here's 150 data points, fill it out. It just steps them through the process and they get rewards with some advice and nudges along the way. They do that. The day or two before the meeting, you can have a look on the platform, see where they're at, and you can call them up and say, look, at the moment, I can't put my hand on my heart and say that I can help you beyond pay your credit card off and bill up your emergency fund and keep your mortgage going. Or you can look and say, great, well, I can see they've got some shares, they've got a property here, they've got a blended family. Great, I know the things I can talk about where I can add immediate value and start talking to that and see if they'd like to take the next step from the virtual digital advisor onwards. And our advisors are looking at how they can package it. So we charge $8 a month per user. That's it. That includes banking, links, and download SOAs often you want and all that sort of stuff. But if I was looking and saying, well, I might charge them $20 a month, but it will include a guaranteed turnaround of five days by email from an advisor if you've got a question. Or if you want fries with that, pay an extra $500 a year to have one, a one-on-one meeting with us. Um, what it, so you can package it that sort of way. Um, and anything beyond the $8, they, they keep themselves and they do the implementation or product recommendations, whatever it may be, and they go down that sort of path. Yeah. And so that's where they're doing it. And another firm is basically looking and saying, well, we like to go to corporates and we want to get the C-level executives, but the C-level executives want to make sure everyone's taken care of. So now an advisor with this tool can put their hand on the heart to that CEO and say, I can guarantee every single one of your staff can get advice. It'll be a mix of digital only, digital with ad hoc um, interaction, or full-on face-to-face that we have, and I can come in and run webinars, lots of stuff. You can package that up, and all of a sudden you become that trusted advisor for that firm. 
um, that allows you to go in that way. And they're the sort of things that we're, we're talking to advisors about. Yeah, that's, yeah, they're both both options sounds great. And um, to me, the uh, you know the first one around the ongoing service agreement when advisors are talking to clients around you know what are they going to get for their fees over that twelve month period until next time. Uh, this seems to be you know for eight dollars a month seems yeah. to be uh, you know could could it could well fit within that budget. Yeah, well, it's a living plan, isn't it? They've got and at twelve months we build something in. Says, hey, do you want to keep on uh, utilizing this um, this plan? And so for me, it's it's turning advice into a subscription service. Uh, where the clients are there. And the analogy I use is that, you know, before the travel industry was open, you go on to line of corners and the only fee you'd pay would be the credit card transaction fee outside buying the airline ticket. That's the sole service. That's the map my plan of financial planning. Then the next step really is ad hoc. You might actually just want someone just to implement the investment changes in my suit for me. But you're going to have to pay some for your time. That's the same as, oh, I need to split. My, my wife and me got to travel different dates now. I can't do it online. I've got to call Qantas, pay the 100 bucks. Because I've got to pay for that person's time, pay for their time to do the investment options. Or you walk into flight centre, you say, I want to leave in this date, come back on this date, stay in these nice hotels, go to these places and these dates, sort it out for me. That's your full holistic financial planning. Um, so it's having those things, but allowing an advice practice to allow a client to move seamlessly through each one, I think is the critical part. Yeah, and have some bit of a choice on where the money's being distributed, as in I don't want to pay for stuff that's not value to me. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Now, um, I wanted to ask you about, uh, obviously, you've got your own AFSL, or you create digital plans. Those digital plans, a lot of the time, are created by an algorithm. Um, your AFSL essentially is providing, you know, the licensing for you as the advisor providing the advice. Talk to me about that, because a lot of the information that's coming out is not necessarily financial product advice. And as you said, you're not going to be involved in products. You know, you do an SOA, sometimes you might not need an SOA. Yeah, yeah. So the funny thing is an AFSL is not a license to give advice. It's a license to sell financial products. And I think that's the fundamental thing that's, that if we can shift that and make it a license to give advice and fundamentally change the industry, but that's a whole other podcast. But for me, we basically looked at it and said, well, the average person in the street, average Joe, you know, it's like if you ask them, what do you earn? What do you spend? What are your goals? And I tell them, well, you should do this, this, and this. That's personal advice. I mean, that's as far as they're concerned, they're getting personal advice. So the approach we took, let's just embrace it and say, well, look, everything on here is personal advice, whether we go to products or not. Now, to the letter of the law, when you influence the consumption of a class of financial products, you're giving personal advice. So we influence the, the consumption of insurance or superannuation with extra contributions and all that sort of stuff as well. So we do fall over there. So we thought, well, let's just hold ourselves to the highest level of standard um, and go from there. And the SOA for us is basically a PDF version of what they can see on the, the dynamic platform. It's a record for them to take. And legally, we've got to put the word statement of advice at the top. Um, and so that's why we go about and doing it that way. Excellent. So you take, the, you take the idea that you're influencing a decision in some way and you're giving them information to be able to make a decision, an informed decision, let's say, but uh, just not necessarily giving them information around which particular product they should be using. Yeah, well, to start off with, we help them optimize their current products. Yeah. I mean, let's face it, if you look at superannuation, there's no perfect super fund. It doesn't exist. So okay. the focus shouldn't be on about moving, but it should be about, well, are they the right goals? Are there extra contributions you can make? Is that the right investment option? And how's insurance inside of super going to affect you? All those things should be taken into account before you start thinking about, gee, should we look at a different super fund? Yeah, um, I, I refer to them as the egos or, or logos on the top. Uh, yeah, and, and they all abide by the CIS Act, right? They all doing the right thing. Um, you know, they've all got trustees in place. They've all got regulation in place where they're not, you know, step outside. They all offer similar things. It's just at the at the end of the year, you'll be able to work out which one was better because you can look back in time. Yeah, that's the only way you can do it. In hindsight's yeah. lovely. <laughs> hindsight, yeah, very good. So, uh, so that's that's good to know. So you basically go above and beyond what you think you might be needing, just you know, because it's the right thing to do. Basically, yeah, I, I think it's fundamentally the right thing to do. Now, talk, let's talk about scale. You've obviously grown phenomenally in the last few years, um, and I'm, I'm looking at a, a um, I'm thinking about a uh, you know a compound interest curve on steroids. <laughs> you know, where to from here? What are your thoughts around you know what what does this look like in a couple of years? Uh, what are your big plans and goals? Yeah. Look, in five years' time, Matt, my plan will be the largest provider of advice in this country, measured by one thing: the number of people we help. I'm not interested in the vanity metrics of AUM and number of advisors and all that sort of stuff. And that's around about a quarter of a million people. That's what we want to be able to do. Wow. Um, pure and simple. Quarter of a million. And uh, and it's interesting that you dismissed um, AUM 
from all those conversations. I think that, um, that to me, they're a hangover from, um, you know, the product days of, you know, and we use that term and we measure that as a, as a, as a crazy benchmark, but that doesn't actually mean anything. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's who you're helping, how many people you're helping. It's, that's fundamentally it. But as an advisor, if you're helping tell people improve their lives exponentially, that's fantastic. I mean, it's irrelevant of their net worth and how that's moving. It's just, are you helping them achieve the things that are important to them? Yeah. Period. Are you seeing a, um, an uplift in employee benefit schemes and programs at the moment based on the last 12 months or do you think they're always yeah. coming? Oh, back in 2018, 2019, talking to people about financial well-being of their staff, it's like, oh, yeah, that's nice. Yeah, whatever. It's a bit fluffy and everything else. You do not have to explain to any senior manager the importance of the financial well-being of their staff anymore at all. It's now a matter of... and. Every conversation we have with a corporate, it's never a matter of we don't like that, we don't think it's going to work, we don't think it's relevant. It's can we do it in the time and now and do we have budget to be able to do it? It's never a, a bad idea conversation, which is great because it, you know, it helps productivity and everything else. But I think fundamentally it's something that every employer has to do because none of us work for free. We do it to improve the lives of ourselves and our family and hopefully get really good intellectual stimulation from the work that we're doing. But fundamentally, it's to improve our lot in life. And so I think it's a responsibility of employers to empower people with that. And the great thing from our stats is that 58% of staff, the number one place that they look is to their employer to provide them with tools to help them on that. The funny thing is only 14% of organizations do anything at all about financial well-being. And half of that, half of that figure is just having the superannuation fund come in for a semi-annual, you know, get together in a bit of a, a seminar. But then you go and ask managers and 68% of managers think it's critical or, or very important to improve the financial well-being of their staff. So there's a huge chasm. And as an industry, we can play a huge role in filling that gap, whether it's one-on-one advice, whether it's through tech like us or a combination of both. The employers are screaming out for it. So, yeah, it's up to us to fill that, I suppose. Wow, that's, that, they're massive stats, you know, like from 58 to 68% with staff expecting and managers to expect and then 14 that actually do. That's, um, that's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, it is. I mean, and so, so we asked we asked staff if their employer does and if management, if they do, and they both came out pretty close to the 14%. Um, so it wasn't that the staff didn't know about it. The staff was a little bit lower. Uh, they probably didn't know about it and stuff. But, yeah, it's – but you can't argue with the logic. Eh? It's Of course it's going to help. It's going to help the productivity of your workforce, for goodness sake, uh, while at work. If you're not, you know, if you're not financially stressed, you're not distracted, spending three and a half hours worrying about your finances while you're at work, mm. which is, you know, almost half a day a week yep. that an employer loses when an employee is financially stressed, yep. let alone white collar crimes and all that sort of stuff, just being distracted at work and having to deal with that stuff. That's, that's, um, and, and I know there's been a lot of surveys on that and productivity, loss of productivity um, with regards to that half day a week. And yep. that's something you also talk to employees about, obviously. Yeah, I definitely. Um, and they, they're aware of it because there have been so many, so much service about it. And it's the same stats, UK, US, Canada, Australia. They're all pretty much similar stats that go across it. And that's the sort of stat we used to lead with in 2018, 2019. Now it's basically like we know the impact of COVID. We've got to look at, you've got to look after your staff. And here's a tool that can help them do that. And off they go. So the conversation is easy. It's all about timing. Um, that's suitable for, for that organization. Yeah, fantastic. All right. Well, we, we might um, wrap, wrap this up. But how, tell us, how um, uh, how can advisors get hold of you or, or um, if they wanted to continue this conversation? Yeah. Um, shoot me an email, paul at mapmyplan.com. Shoot me a message on LinkedIn or on our website, on our homepage. There's a little contact form there. They can come in and do that. But it'd be great to have a chat with anyone and, and unveil what we're doing next and, and try to uh, to make things even more seamless for clients. Fantastic. Are, are you able to give us a bit of a sneak peek into what's coming? A little sneak peek. We're going to have automated intra-fund advice, so advice about your investment choice and insurance inside of super. And the next one is going live probably about March, April. You know, clients go to Finder, all those compare to market sites, and they find a better credit card, health insurance, um, the super fund, a home loan, or whatever it may be. Imagine if you've got an online platform like my plan, like my plan that has got all of your financial plan and then all the different financial products you use. Imagine clicking one button for each of them going, would you like to see if there's a better deal out there for that product? He's like, yeah, I would like to see if there's a better credit card for me. The best one's not having one, but nonetheless, what's important to you? Low interest rate and rewards. Great. Here's a list of all the ones in the marketplace ordered by the one that's going to save you the most amount of money in the next 12 months based on your current situation. 
click the button to go to the provider if you want or don't. It doesn't really matter to us. But we just want to basically make sure that people have got the idea or understand that there could be a better deal out there. And if they do transact, then that's great for them. If they don't, we don't care either. But it's it's going that step further with that information they need when they need it to make that well-informed decision. Let's let them know if there is a better product out for them. And mm-hmm. so we're developing that out at the moment as well. And I like the way that you talked instantly started with their preferences. Yeah, it's it's they drive it. It's not us pushing it or anything else like that. They decide what's important to them and we'll just show them, okay, well, this is the one that saves you the most. And if you don't change, that's okay. It's up to them. Fantastic. Well, busy year ahead by the sound of it. Um, a lot of, lot of stuff to release, plus also a lot of growth in the works. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you, mate. Yeah, it's, it's a journey. And as a startup founder, it's never fast enough. <laughs> <laughs> well, looking from the outside in, it looks like it's uh, you're getting very good growth, you know, this year, next year, and uh, it's all onwards and upwards from here. I think you've done the You've done the hard yards and hopefully the compounding effect takes kicks in now. It does feel like it, but like you said, in a year's time, we'll be able to look backwards and see what happens. Yeah, wonderful. Thanks, Paul. Really appreciate it. Good man. Thanks a lot. Well, there you have it. Another episode of the XY Advisor Podcast. I'm Fraser Jack, and I am joined at the moment by Emily Blanche. G'day, Emily. Hey, Fraser. How are you? I'm tremendous. Thank you for asking. Now it's a great part of the week. We get to do a couple of shout outs and uh, who are we going to have a shout out to today? Yes. So today I want to give a huge shout out to XY advisor Kelly Harris up in the Sunshine Coast. She reached out and said, Em, I absolutely want to organize and start a group for the XY advisors up here in the sunny coast. Now, these guys discussed this at the Deconstructed Christmas Party Tour last year, and we finally kicked it off. Uh, So I'm really excited. They're they're already in there collaborating. Uh, It's an opportunity to get to know each other's businesses, get to learn what they're up to, share their ideas. Uh, And they've already organized their first local catch-up for the year, which is really exciting. So well done, guys. I'm really excited to see this group come to life and see more collaboration. Yeah, well done. Big shout out to all those advisors in the Sunny Coast who are joining that group and to to the other regional groups we've got around the country. This is such a great idea for smaller regional groups. I think there's a group in Illawarra and even Bundaberg. So if you're in a local uh, regional area and you want to start up a group, then I recommend you uh, have a quick shout out or, or, or reach out at least to, uh, to M and we'll see what we can do.